Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the third day of our conference, and today is a very nice and exciting day uh, in front of us. We will have, uh, we will begin with the five talks, and then there are visits to the labs in the afternoon, and we will finish hopefully with the Christmas dinner in the evening. The first speaker today is Cassandra Hahn from the University of Edinburgh, and she will speak about temperature-dependent vector solitary wave interactions in pneumatic liquid crystals. Cassandra, over to you. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? Thanks. So I wanted to start off to, by thanking the INI for hosting me here. And this is me and my colleagues who've worked on uh, two different studies that I'm going to present today. My apologies to our um, fearless leader here because she's already seen the first study at Bremen. I don't know if anybody else was at Bremen. Probably not, so the rest of this will be new. So we're working with passing light beams through pneumatic liquid crystals. They're um, a substance that when you have it at a temperature between 22 degrees and about 45 degrees Celsius, it becomes elastic and susceptible to orientation of its long molecules when you impose an electric field on it. It's a very special kind of substance because, as people may know in this audience, if you take it below 22, it becomes a solid like that table, and above 45, it becomes a liquid and not really um, responsive to electric fields. So these long molecules in the presence of an electric field will form dipoles and orient to minimize the energy. So here we've got our electric field, um, the wave vector, and our long axis is going to be the z-axis here, and you can see the long molecules. So if you pass a light beam through this, what happens is it tends to focus and stay focused as it travels, and it's something that you wouldn't really expect, at least I wouldn't, when I shine, say, a flashlight at a tank of water. Of course, it has an intensity at the beginning, but then it simply spreads out and dissipates. So we study these waveguides that are formed in the crystal by looking at the effect of temperature, and that will be on both the studies that I'm presenting today. So the refractive index changes, again, with the response to the external electric field that we place this material in, but also the electric field that's generated by the light beams itself. So temperature will modify that refractive index, and it affects the formation of two-peak solitons, which is two-peak solitary waves, which is the first study that we've done, and also the second study passing two waves through the crystal at the same time and seeing how they interact and influence each other. Our analytic approach to this was to use a adiabatic approximation specifically based on momentum conservation. And then couple that with the original equations being based on Frank Osteen, which is simply talking about the material itself and how it responds to different forces, bending it, twisting it, and splaying it. So both methods that we used here provided similar analytical results, and they did predict the paths very accurately. This is just the physical setup. As we increase the intensity, and I'll talk about this in more detail later, we find that at a certain spot, not too intense, certainly not too weak, the light beam will focus and exhibit nonlinear behavior. So here, I like to use pointers. I don't like to use laser pointers like wooden pointers. Here's um, the beam as it approaches the liquid crystal. There are those long molecules which are pre-oriented here along the short axis at a theta sub naught, an initial anchoring angle. And then the beam passes through the crystal. The external ex electric field that you can't see here also tends to move them, orient them. And what they experience is a walk-off. So you have the pointing vector and you have the wave vector. And the pointing vector, of course, is where the energy goes. And 
the wave vector is perpendicular to the wave fronts itself. I believe that's group velocity versus phase velocity there. And the walk-off is that you'd expect this beam to run in parallel with its wave vector, and instead it shifts, and that's walk-off. So it propagates at an angle to the beam wave vector. And again, there's our theta sub naught there, the original orientation. And here, we're just showing how this focusing occurs. So the first image here is simply uh, diffraction because the beam power is too low to elicit this orientation respo reorientation response. And then as you increase the power, you'll notice that it does tend to focus and propagate. And again, as I started this talk, which you'd expect when you shine light through anything, I would think anyway, you would get this, but you don't, you get this. Uh, an important, well, a nice side point to make here is that uh, you would think this would just continue with increasing beam power, and it doesn't. If you make the beam power too strong, you get catastrophic collapse, and it only travels a little bit before it pinches off and dies. So this is our general set of equations, uh, NLS for the beam, and then elliptic equations for the medium response and for the temperature response. And here again up here is that walk-off factor, which is going to be quite important in our work. And then we have, this is the non-dimensional system. I figured for this group of people, I wasn't going to go through the derivations of how we got here. So this is all non-dimensionalized. We have parameters associated, of course, with each equation which characterize it. Here's our walk-off for the beam itself. Here's non-dimensional elasticity for the medium and non-dimensional um, non thermal conductivity for the temperature. And I thought I would put this in because this is such an unusual looking term here. This is not the Laplacian. It's actually um, related to that walk-off angle, again, delta that you saw in the previous slide. And it's, again, mostly composed of um, perpendicular refractive indices and uh, trig functions based on that initial angle. So this is our original system. This is our basic system for modeling this NLS and two elliptic equations. And study number one, now that I've given you the environment and the equations that lie behind beams passing through the environment, study number one was volcano-shaped beams. So as I noted, in thermal media, you get this self-localization of the light and it varies directly with the degree of non-locality and material response in an NLC, pneumatic liquid crystal, or thermal media, in, thermal media in general. The important thing here is that it's a response that being characterized by an elliptic equation affects the entire medium at the molecular level. The entire medium will respond to the beam's passage. And we can generally write that here as um, this elliptic equation where you have the diffusion coefficient. Again, the important idea here is that the whole media responds to the beam's passage. It's not local, it's non-local. Again, this is our thermal equation, the third one from that set of three. And what we find is that with a particular combination of focusing and defocusing, and this is a point I want to stop and make here quickly, because it's important, and I think it can be misunderstood, is that there's an interplay that's constantly going on between the beam, which has its heat and its own electric field, the electric field that the medium is in, and this very special medium, which is elastic and composed of these long molecules, which are influencing the beam and vice versa. You know, two electric fields at play, power of the beam, and the reorientation of those induced dipoles. So it's not just the beam responding to the medium, it's the medium responding to the beam. It's just this constant dynamic interplay that's going on here. That's an important thing to note. Uh, as I said to a few people before I gave this talk, it's not like bumper cars. We're not just throwing the beams out there and watching them bounce around. The medium is guiding and directing them. So 
at low powers, and I can talk about various powers for these regimes if you're curious. At low powers, what you get is a basic Gaussian. And I should note here that what we're looking at, I'm saying, well, what is this? I can see the Gaussian here, right? Here's the, the beam itself. This is the director. What is that? The director, if I go back just real quickly here, is the average orientation of the molecules throughout the pneumatic liquid crystal. So when we talk about the director equation, equation number two there, and the um, elasticity, we're uh, talking about the average orientation of the molecules. They're not going to orient completely um, uniformly. So, and this last bit here is the, the temperature envelope. So the black is the temperature envelope, the blue is the beam intensity, and this little red bit is the director. Low powers, we get a Gaussian, we turn the power up a bit, and we get a volcano. Volcano in the director, that again, that reddish profile, and a volcano in the beam itself. Again, important point down here at the bottom. These are fundamental solitary waves. They're not a bound state of two out-of-phase solitons, which people could think. Is this where you were talking about the two beams? No, that's the second study. We'll get there. You turn the power up enough, and you get these volcano solitons, and they're solitary waves, and they're stable. So I gave you the general equation before, the general system. This is modified for this particular instance. And the only real difference here is that we're throwing in this f of t, and we're also incorporating the um, pre-tilt here, q. And you can see f of t, of course, in the eighth and ninth equations here, but um, that gamma, because we're not concerned about trajectory at this point, we're concerned about shape, we've left that off, and instead we have this new operator um, where you ha do have the Laplacian and we incorporate the non-dimensional pre-tilt. Remember, the pre-tilt was from that second slide, I believe, where I talked about how the molecules are initially anchored to the short axis. Oh, and you will see um, a lot of these little epsilons here um, in various configurations, and that we're talking about anisotropy. So for a pneumatic liquid crystal, when we look, we have those or molecules oriented in a particular way. Well, if you look down one axis, you're going to have one refractive index. If you look perpendicular to that, you're going to have a second one, which is common for birefringent materials. So if you see little epsilons, except for that one, that's free space permittivity. We're just talking about the difference between those refractive indices. How similar are they? So this, again, is our NLS and two elliptic equations for the volcano solitons. To go ahead and solve this now, I'll go through our analytic technique. We pick Gaussian profiles for the beam and for the director. We get an average Lagrangian, which as people know who have done average Lagrangians is more of an art than a science where it talks about the power in the system and how it behaves. And that already is fairly complicated. And then for our modulation solution, we take variations on that. So this is um, parameter variations, a variational approach, if you will. And here are the wave parameters. This is for the beam itself, the amplitude and width. Alpha and beta are the amplitude and width for the director. Phase and C here is the placement of the peaks of those Gaussian beams. Um, well, the two humps, the two peaks on the volcano. So um, just to give you an idea of the complexity here, this is the modulation equation just for the beam width. So you have that Lagrangian, you take variations on all those parameters. So they get quite complicated. But once we've done that, our original system, remember, look like that. We take modulation equations, and then we also, of course, do our brute force full numerical um, discretization, and then we compare the two. And we get really, really good agreement. So we were pleased about that. Uh, here, I believe the red line was the modulation solution, and then the 
green line here was the full numerical solution. And again, I can go into detail on that if you would like. But we got great agreement here, and this is for a um, fairly typical amplitude of 0.5. Something I should make a point of here is that these parameters for elasticity and thermal conductivity need to be order 100. That's important for the solution for it all to work. We could extend this where we have our Gaussians here in just 1D, and we can extend it to 2D, and then we get these very nice 2 plus 1 um, thermal, solitary, thermal optic solitary wave solutions, which look very nice and are very stable. Same idea here, though. Just if you, if you take that idea of that analysis and ex extend it another dimension, we get these profiles. So that was our first study. We got very good results with that. Our second study was to take two beams and send them through the crystal. So the way we set this up was we had beams where we had the initial orientation, having them run through the crystal in parallel, and beams where the initial velocities would tilt them towards each other so they would have a beam crossing. And the refractive, refractive indices for the um, pneumatic liquid crystal, of course, vary with temperature from a background temperature. And this was our expansion here with incorporating the walk-off as usual. And the minus sign for gamma is due to the defocusing optical response or with the heat of the beam itself can cause a defocusing, whereas the interplay with the molecules reorienting, reorienting strongly in the electric field and due to the electric field of the beam too causes a, reorient, uh, a, refo a focusing, defocusing and focusing. Also, I notice in my title it's vector solitary waves. We're just talking here about coupled nonlinear waves that don't dissipate and have constant velocity. So this now is our system for two beams. Again, we've got NLS equations in 17 and 18, elliptic equations in 19, and you can see here how the structure is altered just a tiny bit to we can incorporate the um, temperature dependence for our two beams now, U and V. But again, elliptic equations for the medium and for the temperature. And these were our results for this study. The trajectories, again, as I mentioned, is a process, of an outcome of a <coughs> composite and interactive response. Um, they don't react, the pulses we have here, the beams don't interact directly. Um, since they're incoherent, um, the direct response will help to orient them. When we do have just parallel propagation, we don't lose a lot of energy, but we do lose a bit due to the formation of what we call shadow waves. And I'll address that very briefly in just a moment. Uh, I want you to notice here is that these are our beams passing through the crystal, the shadow waves that are forming, and here is what our director looks like when I have separated beams that only interact through the formation of those shadow beams. Now, if we set the system up so that we do have a crossing, and here again, I wish I had this in one slide, but I don't uh, because of the way the GNU plot works. You have to imagine that these are on the same field and you get that crossing right here with um, a good loss, of, uh, some loss of energy and dissipation afterwards. And notice, because they interact, our director has changed. It's much shallower. You don't um, have as broad of an angle distribution for the director response here. So when they propagate toward each, towards each other, we lose energy. Of course, we still have shadow wave formation, but we also have collision-induced dispersive radiation shedding. Uh, as we noticed, uh, for the velocities less than zero, which is um, having this set so they 
interact, uh, we have major energy loss there. And again, our um, elastic and thermal parameters here are order 100, which are important for this to work. So almost done. When we plot the modulation theory for how this should look, um, looking at the borderline values for the walk-off for um, our modulation solution, again, for our full numerical solution, you'll note that we get decent agreement for v greater than or equal to zero, and we get no agreement at all for v less than zero. And again, why that is, is because modulation theory doesn't take into account that loss of energy. So studying these phenomena in pneumatic liquid crystals, our first study, volcano-shaped solitary waves um, using thermo-optic solitary waves determined from numerical solutions. Um, we considered the effect of temperature on the refractive index and on the formation of volcano-shaped beams in both 1 plus 1 and 2 plus 1. And for paired, the second study, thermal reorientational vector solitary waves, uh, we modeled temperature-dependent complex response of the director to paired vector solitary waves. And we noted here that the modulation theory, though it was very good for the volcano study, was not great um, for the study for velocities less than zero. So as the shape and integrity of the pulses break down due to collision and radiation loss, and also because, and this is where we go back to shadow waves for just a second, recall that we have these lovely structures here. And why we get them goes back again to talking about how this is an interactive environment. You would think maybe that the shadow waves come from the beams interacting somehow as they propagated far enough through the liquid crystal, and that's not true at all. How these shadow waves form is the director, again, which just like our volcano waves, is a double humped structure. The director below the left-hand beam, that forces the shadow beam in the other um, light beam and vice versa um, due to the um, director variable appearing in both those beams equations. So it's the director of the one beam that's influencing the shadow beams in the other and the director of the first, vice versa, influencing that shadow structure in the second. And that's why modulation theory breaks down here because that interaction is not included. We thought um, that the positive velocity case was pretty good. So momentum conservation, that you know, um, velocity doesn't change, momentum doesn't change when a beam passes through pneumatic liquid crystals is a really good approximation for modeling soliton paths as opposed to the full numerical um, brute force way of solving it. It provides simple results for the trajectories and for the structures. Um, and a good explanation for the revolution, and it's very straightforward to evaluate. So the variational approximations we used gave excellent agreement, and that's an important point because prior to these studies, there was a lack of exact solitary wave solutions for pneumatic equations, both with and without thermal dependence, and now we have them. So we've only touched on the effects of temperature dependence for the pneumatic liquid crystal physical properties on solitary wave propagation. And there are a large number of questions open which we hope to address. For me personally, and I'll close here, I'd like to find something, I don't know if I can, but some theory, some other approach where I can get good results for this cross beam situation comparing what is true, what actually works. Remember, this is the brute force full numerical solution something that gives better agreement for those negative velocities. That's where I would like to look next, but it'll depend on where my research team wants to go. But there are a lot of questions left. 
if we pair volcano, solita um, volcano solitary waves, if we do um, more dimensional, uh, higher dimensional solitary wave profiles, etc. So thank you. Thank you very much, Cassandra. Are there any questions? First question there. So a question for the first part. Uh, when yep. you go from a single uh, hump to a double hump, yep. is that a bifurcation or is it just a continuation of the same branch? Do you have some sort of change of stability? Is there still a solution which is a single hump but is now unstable, or is it just evolving as a branch to that? Okay. So volcano solitons are stable. This, uh, nothing much changes except that um, we have power input um, as we increase it past a certain border, which I have here. And there's a point I'd like to make for people that are interested. There is a phrase I'd like to put up here. We've got a tiny, tiny little bit of chalk over here, maybe. Um, I would really suggest um, that people take the time, if you want, stop it up. looking at the work of, uh, what is it, Jung and Kulikowski. And if you put this into a Google search or into your um, university library search, what you want to look at, and this is, these are fantastic studies. They're called super mode, super mode, spatial solitons. And I should say that one of the very illustrious, I, I mean that really, illustrious people on our team. Um, Dr. Asanto, Gaetano Asanto, has also done some work in this field. Cassandra, and I'm sorry, we're start running out of time. Oh, so sorry. Maybe so, it's um, enough here. It's mostly, this is mostly, again, just literally due to just the power increase. They're stable, but we have to say that they're solitary waves because I believe that if you collide them, they can deform, or can change a bit, but generally they're very stable. And this is solely due to increasing power. So if people, um, yeah, we have to get on to the next speaker, so thank you. Uh, if people can see that in the back. I would strongly, strongly recommend that people look this up. The, wor uh, the papers, plural, written by Jung and Kolakowski on supermode spatial solitons and how they change with power input. Okay, we have Wonderful one work. Yes. Two questions. I mean, uh, yeah. I remember in the 90s there was a lot of work on the these multi-hump solitons in non-integrable system like second harmonic generation, but at the end of the day, it was everything was unstable. So I'm, I'm very surprised that here are, these they are, are stable. stable. Yeah. Question is, are they stable? Whatever is the relative strength between the focus in the focus in? I'm sorry, are they relatively stable I, within? I, I, can, I can ask you a question with you in the way. Okay. Maybe not. But Let's I will, postpone I will say that, yes, the rest of discussion for the coffee. Sorry, break. I have to take all this off, right? Okay. Is that, can I? Can you, can you hear me? Okay. Um, yes, they are stable. It's surprising, right? Of the non-integrable um, solutions. Um, but we have to... Over and over again, we've, we've talked about this. Our first study, those we could talk about as solitons because they did not change their shape at all. Right? And then of course, they just, like solitons do, tend to just go on forever without um, having any sort of perturbations. But these we have to characterize as vector solitary waves because I guess at some point, they can be um, subject to diffusion, to some sort of deformation. But no, we, we found these things were stable. It was. Uh, that first day, both these studies were pretty pleased, but the first study especially, because uh, now we have that analytic underpinning, especially incorporating temperature. We really like, I mean, everybody would say that about the research, but we really did like our result.
Okay, our second speaker today is Alejandra Aceves. Uh, 